which uh, helped to explain how our current period of racial conflict echoes previous periods. Uh, and I think that actually resonates with the idea of the ghosts of Jim Crow. These are things that we feel might have been passed, but they still live today. And then Autumn Candidate and Steve Fowle led a liturgy of lamentation. And lamentation is the passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And uh, the idea of lamentation is really key to how uh, the, the One Hope group is, is approaching this uh, process of reconciliation. It's to see it as a process that begins with lamentation. And so I, speaking from my own experience, uh, especially around the issues of reparations, we have a tendency to want to jump to the end of what is it that we're going to do. And the process that One Hope is using is really stepping back and allowing time for this sort of three stages of lamentation, which is understanding what injury and harm has been done. Secondly, to uh, have a period for apologizing. And then lastly, looking at reparations for how we might repair um, the injury. So it really about this process of, of lamentation, our, our own cathedral congregation has a lamentable history, a racist history. And this is one of the things that we're, uh, we've become newly aware of. And that is that the founding of our uh, cathedral congregation was really part of a white flight. So the, um, this white congregation in um, downtown Baltimore uh, wanted to remove to some other part of the city, which is really was a white part of the city. And we may think that this event happened, you know, more than a hundred years ago and that the injury uh, is long forgotten. And part of the process of lamentation is for us to really uh, pause and to see that the injury that was uh, done is still present and um, that it persists to this day. And for us to get in touch with that and to understand how it is that we can begin the process of repairing the injury uh, that, that has been done. Um, so, uh, Sarah, you were going to yep. talk about the, our, our norms for tonight. So, as, as most of you know, we, anytime we have a cathedral conversation or a meeting, we review the ways in which we need to speak uh, to each other and speak for ourselves. So these are, uh, this is an amalgam of some of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission of the Diocese, two different uh, set of norms. Um, so I'm going to read through these quickly and I hope you will all digest them. We are res each responsible for ourselves. We'll explore our own feelings about our attitudes and beliefs, acknowledging that racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, classism, heterosexism, and other forms of oppression exist, and allowing ourselves to pause and lament. We will not blame or shame self or others. We assume that people are doing their best to participate in dialogue, to behave in an anti-racist way, and be ready to sit in our own discomfort. We will appreciate how we are different. We understand our obligation to challenge the myths and stereotypes about our own groups and other groups. We will respect confidentiality. Another story is only theirs to share. We will listen and allow others to process their experience. Um, and we, the bulk of our discussion will come uh, at the end, but we will uh, also have some um, discussion opportunities in a couple of minutes as well. Okay, thank All you. Right. Yeah, so that uh, in a couple of minutes is right now. 
So one of the things I wanted to do is uh, really before we dive into the details of the book, I'd, I'd like to, I was really taken in my own process of going through this material of uh, reading this uh, preamble to our constitution, which I'll just take a minute to read. Um, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. So uh, I wanted to, we wanted to open it up uh, right now, just based on reading uh, this, the, the preamble here, and uh, without really thinking about it too much, how is it that we feel about the uh, legal system in America? Uh, do the laws uh, accomplish, you know, these goals, and do these laws protect you? Uh, do these laws fail to protect you? And uh, are the laws fair? So uh, hopefully um, some of you will chime in and give your points of view about uh, on these subjects. And it's really, there's no right or wrong answer, but it would just be a way to start our engagement is just, just to think about uh, the, the laws in general. So uh, Jim, I think you might be able, if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand or write a uh, something in the chat, and Jim can unmute you. Actually, I just un I just unmuted I'm everybody, so, so feel free to go ahead. No, just yeah. um, on my computer, but it might be different from others. When the questions are up, I can only see a few people. Okay. I'd love to see everybody, so me, but I also, is that? Yeah, let's do this. I will stop sharing uh, for now. That's a good idea, Deborah. Okay, is that better now? Yeah, okay. So if you have a question, feel, feel free to either physically raise your hand and just wave and I'll see it uh, and I can acknowledge you or you can ra do the uh, electronic raised hand. Um, but yeah, any responses to what I just said to the questions? Yes, see Adele. Adele. She asked her. Go ahead, Adele. Adele. Okay, can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, yeah. so I'm not as interested in talking about laws and me because I'm white and privileged and I haven't had it much experience that they didn't um, protect me. So I have to think about that a little more personally, if you want a personal answer. But it's obvious that we know about a lot of laws, a lot of people that have not been protected by laws. And my question to Ed is, will we be getting to that tonight or is that for another night? Uh, yes, we'll be getting to that shortly. I, I really wanted uh, basically just to take a moment to, to evaluate some of our assumptions. So Adele, as you were saying, in your own experience, perhaps you feel the laws are protective uh, for you and that they work to ensure the goals of, of the Constitution. And that's really what, what that. I was trying to I don't know because I haven't thought about it. Yeah, I, okay. I, I was thinking, I've already studied so much or learned so much about how the laws don't affect people who are not privileged but I haven't really thought about myself, but I'll think about okay. how someone else is. All right. Okay. And Mark, you had your hand up too? Um, I, I did because I think, um, I, I, I so love reading the, uh, the preamble to the constitution and wish that that instead of the Pledge of Allegiance was something that mm -hmm. the kids would recite every day uh, so that they could internalize the ideals that it expresses. Um, my, my thoughts about the, about the justice system and, and the laws are that it's, it seems to me like a, like a net with a lot of holes in it. 
it's got a you know tremendous potential to it and it's not so much the laws in many cases as whether they are in fact um, equally enforced and enforced with justice and and as they're intended to be uh, and not all of them are necessarily to the good of everybody in society so it's a it's a it's a mixed bag sort of my feeling and Naomi, were you about to say something as well? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I just wanted to say that the, the, what popped into my mind initially is that if you had asked me that question maybe even five years ago, um, I would not have had the, the kind of awareness that I have now. Um, I'm not, as many of you know, I'm medical, not legal, um, and I've just not paid any attention, or maybe it just hasn't been accessible, um, understanding how, how grossly disparate, you know, these laws are being applied, um, and, and the, the great depth of interpretation that takes place in implementing, um, implementing the laws, but also, you know, enforcing the laws. So I, I guess it's sort of been an awakening for me. It, it continues to be an awakening for me. Um, and, and I think this is part of the education process. Um, and and uh, again, I, I, I guess it's just very striking to me. Thanks. Yes, and Deborah. I think that um, the reading I've been doing, the work I've been doing with my community and the listening I've been doing around history is that when that statement was written, what it meant was we the white people and what it actually meant was we the white men. So if you look back on the history of this beautiful language, it wasn't even written, I don't think, to include people of color and women. Uh, but tonight we're dealing, I don't, yeah, I don't want to, anyway. So I I think the strange thing that's left out is it's hard to even look at the language now and apply it to anything because when it was written, it wasn't written for everyone. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge to look at that language with much uh, respect for me these days. Mm. Okay. Very good. So uh, let's see. I'm going to try to go on. Unless uh, anyone has something else they wanted to say about it, I shall share the screen. Oh, uh, Doris. Doris, are you yeah. raising your hand? I, yeah. I, I'm probably, oh, probably the oldest person here. And I grew up, um, I can remember World War II. I was a very young child, but I remember it because it, it had a big bit, impact on everybody. And I just assumed that uh, we had a good country and that there would be justice and I took it for granted. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, back to the uh, sharing. Right. So uh, a number of you have uh, talked about things in, in my process uh, after reading the book. My, my uh, notion about uh, who the laws protect has been changed by thinking about certain uh, types of laws like the voter ID laws. There's a very compelling article in the New York Times today about uh, the voting uh, laws in Georgia, um, mm -hmm. the stand your ground laws, and then things like uh, rules around bail and and who can afford bail and to be released from, let's say, a simple traffic violation, you know, and that the, these uh, laws do have a very decided edge to them, depending on how you want to look at it. So uh, a little bit, for those of you who may not have read the book, I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview about the author, uh, Dr. Higginbotham. I, he is a uh, African-American man. His father was a physician and the author
father grew up in, uh, on account of his father's uh, work in very exclusive, mostly white communities in uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio, and Beverly Hills, California. Um, and this, I have little yellow um, boxes here, you know, for, for which page numbers. But he had very many white uh, childhood friends, and uh, he noticed in the 60s as a white flight took effect that uh, many, many uh, families from his community in Shaker Heights were moving out to the suburbs, and the uh, composition of the uh, school uh, was changing. He relates a number of experiences of uh, racial profiling by the police uh, at his school and in uh, various sports that he participated in. And uh, he, he relates a number of stories where uh, when there were uh, racial incidents uh, that sometimes his white friends would stand up for him. And, but also there were many times when that didn't happen and how hurtful and disappointing it was. And it's really led to his understanding about how white people have to be active in the dismantling of uh, racial uh, injustice. He uh, went on to graduate from Yale Law School, and he's currently a professor at the University of Baltimore Law School, I think I said, and is dedicated to the idea of um, ending uh, racial injustice. So um, the title, Jim Crow, uh, here I, I just wanted to share my own. Um, uh, I, I hadn't understood the origin of the term, and I just wanted to spend a little time um, explaining that because uh, Dr. Higginbotham does explain it. And it goes back to um, 1828, and there was uh, an elderly black enslaved man named Jim Crow, and he was uh, sort of doing some work, uh, and uh, he was sort of shuffling and moving, and he danced. He was singing this song out loud uh, as he was doing so, and it, and it went to wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. So he was just sort of doing this, and a um, white entertainer who happened to be visiting um, where he was uh, saw the song and was really taken by it, and he appropriated the song and dance. And uh, this was the beginning of blackface. So he um, uh, made himself, uh, gave himself a black face. Oh, Ed, uh, we just lost your audio. <clears throat> uh, wireless headset, and I don't know if I'm still it's, on. Yeah, it's working. So, so this uh, white entertainer uh, started um, uh, entertaining uh, white audiences, and this was sort of the, the this was the basis of minstrel shows. And these minstrel sh shows uh, perpetrated uh, inaccurate and harmful stereotypes of blacks for white audiences. And this was a time when uh, most uh, blacks lived in the South. And many of these audiences were in the North, and this sort of projected a whole uh, very stereotypical and harmful uh, picture of Black Americans. So there was the uh, stereotype, for example, of the happy slave, enslaved person. And what these shows did is systematically promoted this message of white superiority and Black inferiority. And so this is an important concept that Dr. Higginbotham talks about in his book. Uh, and it's unclear exactly how the term Jim Crow came to be used, uh, but it refers, Jim Crow laws refer to the laws that mandated uh, segregation in almost all aspects of, uh, of life in many states in the aftermath of the Civil War and the passage of the Civil War, Civil War Amendment. 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, amendments to the Constitution, which uh, abolished slavery, 
and provided uh, protection of the laws. So Jim Crow really starts after the Civil War to reimpose the racial hierarchy that had been ended by the Civil War. Uh, I would refer you to uh, Jamel Bowie, a New York Times opinion columnist who wrote a very compelling article about blackface. Uh, if you are curious or want to learn more about why blackface is um, is such a, an offensive uh, thing, he goes to explain it in that article. So uh, just uh, the, the groundwork for the book. Um, Dr. Higginbotham talks about a racial framework. Th these are the concepts that we use to perceive uh, one another, whites and blacks. And the first part are these two uh, interrelated but very distinct concepts. And so uh, one of the themes of his book is really that uh, white superiority and black inferiority are separate and related. And one of the um, issues that I found very compelling is that while we often talk about trying to rid the law of um, aspects of black inferiority, where they are not protected in the same way as white people, we uh, don't often get at the idea of white superiority. And uh, these concepts, uh, have, which were originally used to uh, justify uh, slavery, led whites to separate themselves from black in housing, education, sports, employment, and worship, uh, especially that last part with respect to our own community. And uh, there was the legal enforcement uh, of this separation but now the ghost of Jim Crow really uh, refer to the how our private patterns and choices are now continuing this separation of the races, and that this separation has had profound uh, led to profound disparities in all kinds of uh, quality of life measures, like income and wealth and life expectancy. And the third point of his framework is that um, sometimes uh, race-neutral policies continue the victimization because even though they don't refer specifically to um, race, they keep in place um, these um, inequities that were put in place when those laws existed. And that was uh, a large part of what Dan was talking about in his presentations earlier this year. Um, so uh, the, the structure of the book is divided in three parts. Um, the first part of the book is uh, the uh, how the framework was created, this racial framework of a racial hierarchy. Um, and uh, from the founding of the nation through Brown v. Board. Um, so it's really the history, the first part is about the history of Jim Crow. Uh, and the second part is how the framework was sustained after Brown v. Board. Uh, we'll talk just a little bit about that, which is the attempt to desegregate public education. And then the third part is um, how uh, Dr. Abelbotham proposes to end uh, the framework and build a post-racial America. But in the spirit of our uh, work on uh, focusing on lamentation, what we really want to focus on today is really to discuss the history rather than um, the third part, which is how to go forward from here. And the um, Dr. Higginbotham will be here on Wednesday. And so this it would be good to focus on the third part uh, perhaps when he's here. Uh, <clears throat> so um, very, I'm very near the end of uh, just the discussion, but again, I just wanted to lay a very high-level framework of some of these key uh, Supreme Court cases and, and uh, what they what they uh, did. 
So the first um, is uh, Pregnancy versus Ferguson. It was a uh, Supreme Court case in 1896. So this is uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War and the passing of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, and the 14th Amendment uh, provided equal protection under the laws for every citizen. Uh, however, in Louisiana, there was a law that uh, segregated um, blacks and whites to separate railroad cars. So in uh, 1896, um, Adolf Plessy was a very light-skinned uh, black man. He sat in the whites-only car. He was arrested and charged under the law. And the case went all the way to su the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court at the time founded that segregation, uh, rather than being uh, illegal, was actually enacted in good faith for the promotion of the public good. So this is something, as a white person, as I studied this case, I realized, you know, it's always referred to as separate but equal. Uh, and so what we really have to deal with is the fact that there was nothing equal about it. That was just the patina uh, that, uh, that allowed um, this, uh, the racial hierarchy and, uh, and segregation. Um, Sarah, did you yep. want to talk yep. about the Brown v. Yeah. Ford? So the other um, case that is so significant and Dr. Higginbotham spends a lot of time talking about is the Brown versus Board of Education. But there are two different cases. Um, Brown one was passed in 1954 and that stated that segregation was illegal only in public education. And it tied that decision to the fact that black children attending a blacks a black only school were would have feelings of inferiority. And he made the point um, that by making segregation a psychological problem, it actually shifted the blame to the black victims. And then in Brown two, they realized in 1954 that they had not, the Supreme Court hadn't actually determined how uh, states should change their, boards of education should change their policies. So they said, yes, states must desegregate, but it didn't offer any timeline or any consequences. So it's not surprising that five years later in 1960, in 11 Southern states, only 2% of black children attended school with white students, 2%. And one of the reasons that um, Brown two came about was uh, the justices were concerned that if they uh, said anything other than uh, with all deliberate speed, which was the way they asked the states to change their laws, that there would be a revolt in the southern states. So they, um, I was not aware of programs like the Minority to Majority Transfer Program, which allowed white students uh, to transfer out of a school if they were becoming the minority. So they always were preferenced to be in the majority in a school. And um, another law that I wasn't aware of was step laws, which allowed school districts to say that they were integrating, they were just doing it a grade at a time. So depending upon what grade you were in, you could go through your entire uh, elementary and secondary career in a public school and never actually attend school with a child of a different color. So states went to, and districts, went to all kinds of lengths to make sure that the Brown one and Brown two decisions were manipulated to preference their, their constituents and always to make sure that white people could be separated from black students. I should say white students.
Okay, and then um, the the third case, just uh, very quickly, it's Milliken versus Bradley in 1974. So almost 20 years after Brown v. Board, uh, the Supreme Court invalidated a Detroit, Michigan school desegregation plan. Uh, Detroit was a black majority city. Uh, there had been white flight. Uh, the suburbs were white majority. And the desegregation plan involved uh, desegregation across the city county line. And the Supreme Court invalidated the plan uh, because uh, they said that the suburban uh, white majority areas were not formed specifically for uh, purposes of racial segregation and discrimination. Uh, however, because of the uh, demographics of the uh, suburbs in the city, the school deseg uh, the desegregation of Baltimore City School, Detroit City Schools was not possible because there simply were not enough white students living in the city. So this gives you a little flavor of, you know, it's uh, how each uh, effort uh, of the Supreme Court, first, first of all, Brown v. Board is very specifically about public education only. It doesn't talk about voting rights, um, uh, fair housing, um, desegregation, de uh, desegregating other uh, public accommodations. And with each step forward, um, almost invariably there'd be a step backwards. So, and then there, there's a number of laws um, that we, that are currently in place that continue the racial hierarchy. Um, and so we can we can talk about these. And uh, again, it's easy to sort of look at a list. Uh, I, I was aware as I was reading it, just the emotional impact of any one of these things, when you really begin to think about the impact that it has on um, our fellow citizens. So, um, we really want to now throw things open to a discussion um, with that uh, summary of things. And um, I, I guess let me stop uh, sharing and uh, just you know open it broadly. But uh, again, to get at this idea of, uh, of lamentation, of uh, the emotional impact as we uh, begin to think about some of these laws that were put in place, uh, you know, in our name, let's say, um, and, and how do we feel about that? So I'm going to stop sharing and we'd open the floor um, to talk further now. Great. And I've hit the unmute all button. So uh, please feel free to, to uh, say anything you'd like to say. I hate it, and I feel terrible, and it's, I feel that I've lived such a long life without knowing so much. I just, I feel ashamed to be living in America. I feel like I want to escape. It's so bad. It's so tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sarah. Um, I'm not sure how well I might audio will come through, but I grew up in South Carolina, and I went through all of my schooling with never a person of color in the school. I graduated from high school in 1963, and from college in 1967, and never had a person of color in either um, of those circumstances. I became aware of the difference when I started working in Sandtown and saw how people who lived in the neighborhood were treated and how the cops, you know, stopped people for, for no reason at all. And it was just, it was a real educational experience for me. Thanks, Sarah. And we were able to hear your audio, so thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, Doris. 
I grew up in Richmond, uh, even before Sarah grew up in South Carolina. And I never went to school with a person of color until I was in graduate school in the 80s. But um, I had an experience at the age of, of 16 going um, from Richmond to Fredericksburg uh, because I was, I had, um, my uncle and aunt had a place on the Potomac River and I was going up to spend a little time with them. And I guess because of inter interstate commerce being you know, under federal law as opposed to state law, I sat on the on the train next to an African American girl my age, and we had a conversation that went from Richmond to Fredericksburg. It was very lively, and it occurred to me that I was being denied access to a huge swath of the population, and you know, I I'd never thought of. I mean. I took segregation for granted because it's always what it was, what it was. But uh, I thought, oh, there are all these people out there that I don't ever get to interact with. Yeah. 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 Karen, go ahead. Um, one of the things I think is important for us is sometimes this can become the history and thinking about the laws as a very separate, you know, kind of not quite an intellectual conversation, but it can be, it can go that direction that we can as white people talk about and, and white people who may think of themselves as liberal and working towards being an anti-racist person. Um, fundamentally, we have to own the fact that these laws are completely written, created by a white power elite that is keeping the power within white. It is, it's way it's always been. And in fact, it continues really to be that way. And mm -hmm. I think it's important as part of this lamentation idea that we've been talking about. I mean, Ed is sort of kind of pushes through to me is it's this is the, the great grieving and lamentation part is that these aren't just some laws these are our laws mm -hmm. and I think it's important that the system is fundamentally the system that we generally embrace we like to think of ourselves as law abiding and America is this flawed but better than many other countries etc we can we can hide under a lot of that um but i i just think fundamentally the law is you know we're we're responsible for it um i don't think we can we can get away from that it, it isn't those, these laws it is the laws of our country of which white power elite folks are continuing to do, you know, make these laws. I, as I, um, wow, there's a lot going on in my head, sorry. Uh, Dr. Higginbotham was my con law professor at the University of Baltimore, um, constitutional law. Um, and some of the things that strike me when I look at these cases and at this book, and also now as I practice law, firstly, in that constitutional law class, Dr. Hickenbotham and maybe three, only, only three other students were of color. There was a majority white um, class. It was a majority white class that graduated from the University of Baltimore, even though we're in a very diverse city. It's a public school. The vast majority of law students um, were white. At the law firm that I work now, which is extraordinarily committed to diversity and inclusion practices and pro bono and racial justice, the vast majority of the people you see on the calls who are dedicated and devoted to doing this are white. Um, and there are struggles to recruit um, lawyers of color for a, a huge number of reasons. 
And when I've been in rooms, whether it be on the Hill or in various discussions, you look, whether it's on Zoom or in person, there's a whole lot of white people in the room who are making the laws, interpreting the laws, advocating to change the laws, the lobbyists, etc. And while I, th I think the struggle is how do we, that's the struggle. I don't know what the answer is. I don't even know what the next question is, but it's what I'm noticing a lot. And also the recognition of, it's easy to look at some of these laws, I think, and it's probably how I looked at it in my undergrad years when I was looking at some of these constitutional issues of saying, oh, there are all these horrible laws that are disadvantaging people unfairly without fully appreciating how much advantage I was getting as a white male in particular from those laws. It was easy to say, well, hey, I'm liberal, you know, and but the advantage that I have received and taking ownership of that and figuring out what I can do about that, I think is challenging. So that, those are the things that are coming to mind. There are no answers there yet, hopefully. Adil, were you trying to jump in uh, a moment ago? I'm just a little confused, Jim, because I thought the question was, how do we feel? And people are answering it, I think, thus and so, or here's my history toward thus and so. So I feel a little bit like I've done something wrong or I don't get it. But, but the question was, how do you feel? And we haven't, I haven't heard any answers to it. Am I? Yeah. My long answer was, I feel angry and ashamed. Thank you. <laughs> Adele, uh, I feel ashamed. I've been coming to a huge reckoning with, and this is private, but this is a private space, uh, with my theater company. Where the actors of color have said, when you open the theater with the Great American Rep, our new space downtown, the Great American Rep, a streetcar named Desire, and that's the salesman. And the black actors were fit in where they could fit in. These are people I've worked with for 22, 24 years. And understanding their experience in a, syst a liberal system of love and acceptance where people are, you know, we're actors, we're all over the place, right? Understanding their pain in a way that my privilege protected me from in my ignorance because I didn't realize, I didn't realize how I participated in it simply by being a white woman of privilege. And I'm realizing that in a powerful way. So my feelings are shame, but also it's time for us to deal with our shame and move forward with some change. <laughs> we can deal with our shame and talk about it, but we gotta make some changes. So let's let that shame motivate us, right? And really listen and really work hard for change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What other feelings do you have? I can kind of follow up on what Deborah was saying, because I think I feel very similarly, sort of over a same period of time. We, Karen and I bought our house in 1998 when she was pregnant with our son, who just graduated from the University of Maryland. And we thought, oh, we're, you know, we wanted to live in the city, we wanted to send our kids to Baltimore City Schools. And we thought, hey, here's a house we can afford. It's in the Roland Park Elementary Middle School zone. Hey, how lucky are we? This is great, a great neighborhood. And since then, you know, really only in the last few years have I learned that, you know, our 1925 house has a racially restricted covenant on it. Um, back before Brown versus Board of Education, kids in our neighborhood used to walk down to Guilford Elementary School, which is just a half mile down York Road. Um, that was across York Road from a historic African American community that was founded in during World War I, but they couldn't send their kids across York Road to the closest elementary school. And then after Brown versus Board of Education, which was implemented in a very laissez-faire way in Baltimore, um, kids from our neighborhood started going to Roland Park Elementary Middle School and there were no zones then. In fact, school zones were a desegregation measure. That was the federal government forced them on the city of Baltimore to try to draw integrated zones. But the way my neighborhood 
use that process was we advocated to be drawn in a zone to a school that was two miles away, uh, where the zone stopped at York Road, which is this huge racial dividing line now. Um, and so this thing that I wasn't aware of, my kids went to that school. They got a, um, you know, and uh, so I, uh, so I also feel ashamed and, uh, and but also buying our house was sort of, a, you know, we didn't even consider buying on the east side of York Road, which is very African American. We, I mean, it, it never even crossed our minds. You know, like it, it wasn't like we thought about it and decided, no, no, we'll, we'll live in this neighborhood. It never even, we never, we never, it never crossed our minds. And so I, I, I feel like I'm waking up to these things uh, that, you know, that's not just, you know, it's the legal structure, but then it's also what we do with the legal structure. You know, like the school zones aren't a law in and of themselves. They're how the city of Baltimore dealt with um, mm -hmm. implementing Brown versus Board of Education. And, and just in so many ways and so many of us, you know, when I moved here, I was like, oh, so, you know, we're sending our kids to city schools, you know, like we're, we're you know, we've kind of felt, got to feel like good, proud liberals, you know, um, <laughs> and I just, uh, I feel duped and, um, and I, and, and ashamed and, and looking for uh, things to do, like Deborah was saying, you know, looking how, how to, how can we, uh, how can we put this new knowledge um, to work to make to make a positive difference. I do not feel ashamed. I feel fearful for our nation and our city, and I feel angry. Um, and I and I feel sad because I always thought that things would get better. I thought that you know we would make progress, that things would be better. Um, and they haven't gotten a whole lot better. But um, I think it's, it's kind of a waste of energy to beat up on ourselves. Um, and it, I feel it's more productive for me, at least, to try to figure out what I can do. And there's not a whole lot I can do, actually. But... Um, <laughs> I, James, I'm interested in your story about buying a house because we moved to Baltimore in 1967 and we were told very firmly by all kinds of people, you can't live there and you can't send your children to school there. And, and there's something in me that just yeah. says, watch me. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, I'm just so sad that things are not better, that life is still so dangerous. Um, I volunteer in better times with a bunch of kids down in, in West Baltimore. And um, it just, it makes me very, very angry that these terrific kids, these kids who have so much talent and, and so much energy, don't get the same kind of breaks that a lot of other kids in the city get. And this, you know, I think that there's at least a place to put energy. It may not solve the problems of the world, but it's a place to put some energy which, you know, keeps me from despair. I'll just jump in and say that, you know, figuring out how I feel in all of this, a part of it is, is I, uh, somebody said, I think I, that I feel duped. Um, you know, I feel like we're a lot further ahead. I felt like we're a lot further ahead than we are and the big eye opener for me was Freddie Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when, I, when I really understood what was going on uh, in the way that the laws were being applied to people of color in Baltimore, and then how justice still has not been served in that case, uh, then I'm just like, why was I so blind to that? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of, you know, there's the process of kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of an eternally optimistic kind of person. And so I um, just out of deep uh, commitment to try to see the best in people. And so, but that's also kind of uh, allowed me to close my eyes to things that I should have seen a lot sooner uh, or, or known a lot deeper. Um, the fact that the system is so badly rigged against people of color and so badly rigged for people, uh, white people, 
uh, and white male people like me um, that, you know, you know, that, that's, that's been the process for me of trying to just figure this out. And so wanting to be hopeful, but recognizing just how dire it is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in Baltimore in particular, just how dire it is. Um, and sometimes I just shrug because I'm like, well, what are the city schools going to do? Not, you know, think about the situation now. It's, I mean, so I don't like to dwell so much in those dark places, but boy, it's dark. Um, and so that's kind of been, you know, my own kind of trying to figure out where, how I feel about all this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Teresa <clears throat> wrote a, a note in the chat. Let me just read it. Um, she doesn't have a microphone that works, so she can only uh, communicate by typing. So let me just read it so you can all hear it. I feel confused, ignorant, and ashamed. I'm ashamed that I lived most of my life in such ignorance of the ways that people of color were being treated badly. I'm ashamed that I benefited from being the privileged group, even though I was not aware of that until recently. I feel confused about how I have been so ignorant. I feel confused about how this situation can still be happening in 2020. I feel ashamed on behalf of my race because I believe that instead of a plot to maintain power, what has been going on is a whole lot of people pushing for themselves out of fear. I know people who do not want many black people to move into, into a neighborhood because they're afraid that it will start a movement in which the black population grows while property values decline because some white people will flee and not many white people will want to move in. I believe that there are many other examples like this. I'm confused as to how to move forward. Anyone else? Did anyone else say discouraged? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that, Adele, was that you saying that? Oh, you didn't hear me? Uh, I was just saying, I couldn't tell that was you. Uh, You said discouraged? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think Rob said duped. I feel duped. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. People are really getting, getting out their feelings now. I think I'm starting, I'm moving past discouraged to determined. And I, the, the double whammy of COVID and not, you know, I've been a person that goes to marches and protests and it's tough um, with COVID, but I think I'm, I think I'm moving toward I think it's been tough for me. <laughs> Let's look at the reality of toughness, right? For a lot of people in, in the world and in our country. So I think when you say discouraged, which I have been feeling quite a bit, Adele, to be honest, I'm also really trying to focus a little bit more on, okay, so let me get determined and see what I can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the purpose of this whole thing, isn't it? To move beyond that, to actually. Yes, I think. Yeah, I, I, I. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, please go ahead. No, I'm just in awe of um, uh, people of color in this country who have been, <laughs> who have been exhausted for 400 years, and uh, it's time. And and so when I say, you know, I mean the determination and the grace to just keep on for the people, uh, uh, I don't want to generalize, but for a lot of, I just think it's time for white people to say, yeah, it it is what it is. And if I think it's been hard, if it's hard now for me, let me just apply that to the past 400 years for other people Mm -hmm. of color who have lived in that for a very long time. Mm Naomi, go ahead. Yeah, I think Dan said duped, and I, I, I think I'm still stuck in a place where I would even go beyond that and say that I'm angry because, you know, if I think about the way, you know, I was in high school in the, um, in the 80s, and um, 
if I think about the way that I was educated, um, the great opportunities that were lost uh, to make me a better person or to make, to make me more aware, um, to be more grateful that I didn't have to worry about things that other people have to worry about. I, I feel like I could have been a better person. I could have done more. I could have, you know, and, and, and I'm trying now with my own kids, we have conversations every single day, but I still feel yeah. like there were decades there that were lost. And so I'm, you know, I'm still, I'm still unfortunately wanting to do something, but just feeling a bit overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. where to start. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say something just about the, uh, the the questions of law and justice, because I think that 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 underlies a lot of this, and you know, I feel much of the much of the same frustration and responsibility for taking you know taking responsibility for for um, privilege over such a long period of period of time throughout my life. You know, at the same time, I'm, I'm frustrated and very discouraged at the huge gulf between the ideals that are expressed in many of the laws that we know are there to do the right thing and to eliminate the evils that we know are there. And I'm thinking about the Civil Rights Act and I'm thinking about the Voting Rights Act and I'm thinking about all of these things that that are embedded in our that are embedded in our system. And there are many laws that still remain that, that are not just, but there are many laws that are there that are not in fact doing what they're supposed to do. And that the gulf between the ideal and the reality is where we live now. Um, that things are not enforced equally, things are not shared as they are in fact legally required to be that the practice of the society itself is not living up to the ideals or even the stated legalities of what of what's supposed to be there. Um, and I'm frustrated and don't want to despair that that can't happen, but that's you know, looking for ways in which we can assure that at the very bare minimum, and I hate to be minimalist about it, but at the very mere, bare minimum that what we have committed to as a society actually is done and guaranteed to the people it's guaranteed to. And that's not being done. You know, I, I feel like, I feel like the, the national situation has sort of I mean, it's sort of opening our country's uh, our white people's eyes to the reality of the situation just because our president is being so bold faced about it in this election. Um, you know, so so that's playing out at a horrifying scale and um, but it's all out in the open, you know, it's the kind of thing that good politicians wouldn't say out loud, usually. Um, and then also, I feel like the coronavirus uh, has also taught us, you know, with Congress passing a two billion, two trillion dollar, you know, like that, all these conditions, we, it's because we accept them, you know, like the, there's no particular reason that, you know, there have to be so many people in poverty. Um, you know, that it's a decision we, we make as a society, but, but the national level is just so overwhelming. Um, uh, that I find myself more and more drawn to the very local uh, in, in terms of in terms of policies uh, to the very local level where our you know governor said no thanks to a billion dollars in federal money for a new transit line that would have been a bunch of jobs and a bunch of transit access in Baltimore that um, when he in his first year in 2015 um, 
and then uh, I mean even to uh, I, I'm involved on the York Road corridor and the east side neighborhoods are really concerned because a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, recovery houses for people in recovery from substance abuse get located on the east side of York Road because the real estate is cheaper there mm -hmm. and the real estate is cheaper there because of our racist housing market because people like me don't even consider looking for a house on the east side of York Road. Um, and so, uh, you know, and that's something I, we were coming up on election, we got a new city councilman, a neighbor of mine said, I want to know what our, this candidate, I was pitching the candidate I was supporting and he was like, well, what's he going to do about the racial, you know, the racial equity along York Road? And, and uh, I was saying, well, will we support, here's, here's a racial inequity. Would we, it's not in the law, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't know, it's another way that we've sort of twisted civil rights law to insulate ourselves as white people. And um, so anyway, I just think, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm involved with BUILD is because I feel like the, the local level is the place where we can make a difference mm -hmm. um, and have an impact. And then um, the other thing that, that being involved in this One Hope group has, has impressed upon me and I tend to be, I mean, if anyone saw my presentations, I tend to be sort of a more cerebral kind of a person on this stuff, but I think relationships are incredibly important too. I think there's also just the, you know, reaching across these divides that our society has created for us and listening mm -hmm. to people, which is something very powerful that I've been part of this year. But I think we need to do that on the interpersonal level too and understand how um, the experience of just being in this country is so different for us based on our race because, and that's all part of the ghost of Jim Crow. Amen to the part about relationships, Ben. Yeah, I'd, John. I'd like to, um, it's, getting later so I guess it's okay to get into this but I'd just like to say how much I enjoyed reading this book um, it was a wonderful pick um, both from the preface and the introduction um, I really did appreciate knowing more about him as the author as a person um, I thought it uh, particularly in the um, chapter after Brown versus the Board of Education um, complimented Eyes on the Prize and the videos very well. Um, my uh, one slight frustration with it, not really a frustration, but what I hope he talks about on Wednesday is the fact that it was written seven years ago. So it was written yes. pre-Trump and pre-COVID and pre-George Floyd and really pre-Black Lives Matter movement somewhat. Um, I might not be correct on that but um, pre this year anyway. Um, so um, I, I just was very impressed with the book. It was a wonderful choice and um, I, I look forward to Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if other folks have things you'd like to hear um, on Wednesday, I'm gonna be talking with Dr. Higginbotham tomorrow just to kind of, mm -hmm set up the conversation, try to make sure we set it up to get as much out of it as we can. So um, if any other folks have some, uh, I, I was thinking the same thing. It was, mm -hmm. you can kind of, uh, you know, this was, I feel like this was written during the Obama administration with mm -hmm. a, so recognition of how far we still have to go, even with the first black president of our country. Uh, and boy, yeah, I just, I, I wonder what, what he's thinking now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he would have predicted the backlash to the Obama presidency that we have all seen. Yeah. My quick answer is yes. That's my quick thought. Not totally informed, but some of the discussions I had with him, which would have been 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. there were a couple of times I would talk with him after class and, be, and just say, well, we're post-racial, right? I mean, it's all fixed, right? And 
Um, I mean, neither, neither he nor I thought that was true whatsoever, but just some of the conversations coming out of Brown and Plessy and some of the other horrible decisions. I, I, I'm not sure he would have predicted this, but. Yeah. I'm not sure anybody could have predicted Trump. Yeah. God, no. Dan, I do hope that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about an epilogue because several of the things that he talks about in, in the third section, some have started to come to pass like in the um, midterm elections, but if, if we have the opportunity to influence what, he's, what he was going to say on Wednesday, um, yeah, I think this is what everybody uh, who was dug into the book, even a teeny bit wants to know. I would just like to add, uh, you know, a couple of uh, personal observations from the book. Um, I, as I was reading the book, at some point, I um, I just looked down at the cover, you know, which is all backwards, and it's like I saw this picture for the first time with my heart. Mm -hmm. mm. Look at this. Look at this, and what an abomination it is. You know, two water fountains. Uh, just a note from Teresa to Dan for something that she'd like to hear on Wednesday as well. Uh, she wrote, I would like to hear more about the author's ideas for ways to improve the situation. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things I, uh, folks have gotten to the last couple chapters, he, he's a very, his solutions are very pro-racial integration. And I'm, uh, and I tend to, uh, that tends to be my, you as well, but I've heard a, a lot, some weariness about integration that um, I have some of the folks that I work with in build feel that way, you know, that, that uh, integration is, uh, you know, it's, it's been so painful for black people. I mean, he talks about, you know, he has all the stories about growing up, all the, and we're hearing about them more and more in the news, I think, because black people are feeling more that uh, they can sort of speak out and be more believed now. Um, but it's such, it's so hard. And we keep, I feel like white people are like Lucy with the football all, all the time <laughs> um, yeah. on integration. So I'm kind of curious, um, you know, his views on that. And, uh, um, and then how folks here kind of uh, feel about that too. Yeah, uh, Dan, on that front, uh, I have become aware of the fact that I live in a white neighborhood, you know, which is not something I, I would have, I didn't conceive this neighborhood as that way um, until recently. You know, I think maybe we should think less about doing and more about listening and be, I think about Brian Stevenson saying, get proximate. Um, just pay attention and, and listen. And um, as, as Dan said, you know, work on relationships. But uh, I don't think we can come up with a solution Maybe we can sign on to some things that um, are proposed by people more directly affected than we are. Does that make sense? I'm kind of hearing, you know, this idea of what it means to be an ally as opposed to the kind of taking the lead problem solver. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like it takes both though too, because I think absolutely being an ally, absolutely listening, building relationships. But I feel like part of what that leads to as well though, is action, actual tangible actions. And a lot of that has to do with our laws. I mean, that's, this book is all about the laws. Um, and we've, it shows how so often when one law is created, to try to address the situation, another one is put in place that tries to do the opposite. But I think it really is uh, impingent upon us, especially as Christians, that we continue to really push the public policy side as well, because that that is a part of this whole picture too. So it, it can be on the local level, like Dan was saying, it can also be on the national level. And there are different ways to do that. But I, I do think uh, I do think that's an important part along with being an ally and that's one way to be an ally. Yeah. Well, and the good thing too, if I just add, part of the value of the relationships is that gives you the motivation. It, it's, it's people that you're fighting for at that point. When you're fighting for public policy, you're not just fighting for laws, you're fighting for people. You're fighting for people who you know and who you love and right. who you care about and respect. And so I think that's part of why the relationships matter so much is because then it's not just an issue, it's people and you're fighting for people. And clearly loving our neighbor is one of the core tenets of our faith. And so I think that's a, that's, that is why we build relationships uh, so that we're fighting for actual people who we know. Okay, I think we're uh, close to the end. Um, any last thoughts uh, to share? I just, oh, oh Ed, no. can I? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, go I, ahead, please. I wanted to say thank you to James because it was because of your recommendation last fall that we consider including Dr. Higginbotham in some sort of adult formation that, we've, that we got to tonight. Um, so that was a great suggestion. And I ended up buying this book probably about the time that you talked about him in November, but I didn't actually you know, I started it a couple times before March, but it, you know, it was the right, it was the right book at the right time. Um, so I'm really grateful to James. Thank you very much. And for also facilitating our contact with, um, with your old law professor, because of James's actions, he's going to be on a Zoom with us on Wednesday night. So um, we're very, very lucky to have him and also to have you. So I just wanted to say thanks. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, James. Yeah. And just I a logistical thing before we close too, I know we had some problems with the two different links for tonight. Um, so Sarah, I know you'll get something worked out for Wednesday, but um, Sarah, would you be sending out a, a, an email or something with a new yeah. link or, okay. Um, I, you know, we know who was here tonight. Um, we caught a problem last night and thought we had it fixed this morning, um, but we, uh, I, I know now what the issue was. Um, John and I spent a lot of time today on this. Um, so many, many, many apologies. I feel terrible that um, it, was, it was so chaotic, but um, thank you and uh, stay tuned. We hope that everything will be fine as one on Wednesday. We'll try to fix it on our end and we'll be in touch. Well, Sarah, it'll be this same link, right? Isn't this the link for the Wednesday night one? Currently, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to hedge my bets. Um, <laughs> just want to hedge my bets. Yeah. Okay, so when we'll, um, yeah, we're, we, go ahead, Dan, and then well, I just at some point we need to know what the link is. How are I we going to know what the link is? Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Cross my heart. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Yeah. And uh, I wanted, if we could, uh, to end, uh, I wonder if we could all just uh, take a moment to pause and then we could all just pray uh, this 
a piece of scripture together. There is one body and one spirit, just, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Amen. Okay, good night. Good night. Night all. Thank you all for joining. Good night. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ed.